I'll speak about uh, dermatology and imaging, but as we have already spoken earlier, today we'll uh, speak about uh, dermatology and imaging, but as we have already spoken earlier in conventional methods, today we'll talk about role of other, other than conventional radiology imaging methods in dermatology. So what are the recent imaging modalities in dermatology that we are adopting? One of course most popular and simpler is the ultrasonography with or without color Doppler. Occasionally color Doppler may be used to know the increased vascularity to the lesion. Second arthrography, today conventional arthrography is not done that much. Occasionally where there is no MRI or other facilities, still the orthopedic surgeons and rheumatologists prefer arthrography. Angiography, rarely we use after the color Doppler. MDCT, by MD means multi-detector multi CT, common. Radionuclear scan, radionuclear scan also is used for therapy to in case of synovial thickening and granulomatous disorders. MRI and MR arthrography, after the advent of MRI, the conventional arthrography almost is not done. Then recently PET CT scan and occasionally vascular and interventional radiological methods. For a man with a hammer in his hand, wanting to use it badly, everything in this world looks like a nail needing hammering. This I have said by Mark Twain. Why I said is, supposing you have got a facility of MRI, radionuclear scan, immediately you jump to, all right, pain in the shoulder, do MRI. Forgetting about the simpler methods like conventional radiology or ultrasonography. Ultrasonography is simpler, as I said earlier, cheaper, making its impact in the initial diagnosis of arthritis, even before conventional radiology. Sometimes you are dedicated to ultrasonography and musculoskeletal surgery. You don't have to resort to usual conventional radiography, where there is some risk of radiation exposure. Ultrasonography, 2.25 to 10 megahertz. Difference in acoustic impedance, that is the principle. The difference in acoustic impedance in the various tissues like bone, soft tissue, fluid, etc. For example, in this particular case, if you look at the ultrasonography scan, a anechoic lesion is seen which is Baker's cyst, the popliteal fossa. Now, in all the various types of arthritis, what are the advantages? Mostly we have got advantages only. Only disadvantage is that it is subjective, that means the doctor has to be with the patient in order to do that. Whereas in conventional radiography, CT, MRI, the imaging technologist or the radiographer can do and show the pictures monitored by the particular radiologist. Advantages, cheaper, simpler and no radiation. Immediate information, as we are doing a fluoroscopy, you see virtual images. Same thing in ultrasonography. Immediately, you can get the information between, particularly between cyst and solid. Often, even clinically, a cyst containing foam fluid, you cannot differentiate whether it is really solid or cyst. Effusions, immediately you can aspirate. Soft tissue and bone changes you can see. Tendon, ligament ruptures also, easily you can diagnose, which by conventional radiology is not possible. And all muscular pathology also, muscular tears, muscular infiltrate by fat, metoma intramuscularly, all these things can be detected by ultrasonography. For example, in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, look at these uh, pictures, you could see the synovial thickening by the irregularity. And here I said acoustic impedance. So we, here we are talking about echoic areas, anechoic areas, hypoechoic areas, or mixed echoes. These are the terms that we use generally in ultrasonography. Same thing in uh, on your uh, right hand side lower picture shows the erosion, early erosions on a plain film of the hand for example, early erosions may not be seen unless 40 percent of the cortex is destroyed. Again another case of osteoarthritis with Baker cyst and loose bodies within. As I said the principle is the cyst is anechoic or hypoid. 
whereas the loose bodies either a chondral or osteochondral they reflect they are echoic that is how he would differentiate that is a operatal force of Baker's cyst but in there there are loose bodies multiple loose bodies one on your uh, left hand side you see 30 year old woman swelling in the left shoulder that is the presentation to the rheumatologist and then on the plain film all you see is a soft tissue swelling around the head of the humerus head and neck of the humerus no bony erosions you can see no lytic areas you can see no calcifications you can see same thing down a picture again the lateral view of the humerus again you see the soft tissue swelling with no non-descript type of features whereas ultrasound on your right hand lower side you could see multiple echogenic loose bodies non-specific response to chronic synovial inflammation these these are called rice bodies but these also can be seen in uh, say for example tuberculosis also now in sports today sports is very active part uh, all the young people and students are taking active part so sometimes you find ruptures of ligaments as well as tendons so this is an example radiograph on your left hand side shows a soft tissue swelling in the region of the Achilles tendon of course this is a calcaneal spur which is not very significant and then you don't know there is a hematoma or a rupture whereas in ultrasonography you could see the space and the hematoma and the, because of the rupture of the Achilles tendon that is the advantage of ultrasonography it is chronic also you can tell there is calcification calcified hematoma now again transfer scan edematous tendo Achilles with calcification look at the calcification echogenic area the reflections you could see and in this particular case again there is retraction of the proximal end you could nicely see by the arrows and a hematoma hematoma look at this it is echogenic that means it is a chronic hematoma it is acute collection of hemorrhage or any fluid it will be anechoic then sonography power doppler color doppler and power doppler for example this carotid artery with various collagen vascular disorders immunological disorders you may find some changes in the vasculature this is only an example of how a power doppler shows the color flow high sensitivity to the intraluminal flow and then if there is obstruction there are plaques if there are ulcers you can nicely see as reflected now in old days even today maybe rarely they do to do contrast arthrography because in plain films you don't see the ligaments bursa and tendons so in contrast hydrogenated contrast you can use water soluble contrast you can use and inject into the shoulder and here you could identify the rotator cuff tear and the spill of the contrast into the subscapular bursa and at times there is a frozen shoulder not much of contrast could be injected limited space due to capsulitis and because of the additions here again in the contrast arthrography in the knee patient is having a pain in the knee particularly in the popliteal fossa often it is difficult to differentiate whether it is a ruptured baker cyst or there is thrombophlebitis the thrombosis of the carphoids that is the major differential diagnosis in the cough pain so in that you do a contrast arthrography and there is a rupture there is a continuation of the sinual cavity into the baker cyst look at the contrast and instead of using single contrast with hydrogenated contrast occasionally you can use air mixed with uh, hydrogenated contrast this is again just an example of the baker cyst and also note the different additions in the suprapetalar fossa pouch again synovial plica in the air arthrogram air contrast arthrogram you can identify the landmarks of the bones patella and suprapetalar pouch and in the so called synovial plaque sometimes not always are significant and produce pain in the patients and hip arthrogram particularly in children where there is suspected uh, congenital dysplasia of the acetabulum and hip with a dislocation mild subluxation you can use hip arthrogram to show the arthrogram 
and the limbus uh, in the capsule and angiography. When do you use angiography? Rarely we use in rheumatology, but then rheumatology comprises vasculitis, arthritis, osteoporosis, ligamentous stairs, all these entities. So, for example, this is a periarthritis nodosa, an uncommon, not so common periarthritis nodosa, collagen vascular disorder. Note multiple micro aneurysms of intrarenal arteries. Very nicely, they are shown as a spherical densities. These are aneurysms, micro aneurysms. You don't have to do a biopsy of an artery in order to diagnose periarthritis. And rarely also we use lymphangiogram to show the nodes, even in rheumatological arthritis, etc. You can get not only sinusoidal effusion, region lymph nodes also may be enlarged, for example, still specific. So, where you can see the lymphatics as well as the lymph nodes, enlarged lymph nodes. And then, most important is bones, measurement of bone mass, particularly where? Case of osteoporosis. Is this osteoporosis, osteomalacia, or the degree of osteoporosis? Osteoporosis is a silent epidemic. So, conventional, as I said earlier, 30 to 40 percent of the bone has to be depleted before you say there is osteopenia of the bones or osteoporosis of the bones. Single photon absorptionometry, dual X ray absorptionometry, DXA, that is more or less popular today. Quantitative CT, not so popular. Quantitative GS not yet popular. Osteoporosis, as I have said already, it is a progressive systemic skeletal disorder characterized by low bone mass and micro architectural deterioration of bone fragility and susceptibility to fractures even with minor trauma. As I said earlier, it is a silent epidemic. Porous and fragile bones, fracture as of course disability. The World Health Organization has defined certain things. For example, osteopenia, they said low bone mass, bone mineral density is more than one standard density below N normal mean and less than 2.5 standard density and below N normal mean. Measurement of bone mass, as I said, repeat again, conventional single photon, dual X-ray absorptionometry, quantitative CT, quantitative yes. and because today we are able to diagnose osteopenia or osteoporosis, particularly in the axial skeleton with compression of the vertebral bodies, it is easy. Vertebroplasty is being done in order to maintain the strength of the bone. You inject some sort of a cement into the body of the vertebra, thus increase the size of the body of the vertebra. What are various causes? Endocrinal, Cushing, Turner syndrome, diabetes, hyperparathyroidism, hypopituitarism, hypothyroidism, hypogonadism, and besides senile osteoporosis, postmenopausal osteoporosis, etc. Again, WHO, World Health Organization, has graded osteoporosis into normal, osteopenia, osteoporosis a degree more, and severe osteoporosis. Osteopenia, as I said already, is generalized diminished bone density, such as you see even in conventional radiographs. Osteoporosis is due to inadequate osteoid synthesis. Often, our students get confused with osteomalacia and osteoporosis. Easy to remember. Osteoporosis is due to deficiency of the proteins, whereas osteomalacia is due to deficiency of the M mineral. And then again to include some of the other entities, senility, dietary deficiency, endocrine abnormalities already we have counted, disuse atrophy or stress deficiency, hypoxia, idiopathic sometimes probably it is genetic, we do not know, racial, we do not know, but idiopathic osteoporosis is also seen and iatrogenic with the drugs, particularly steroids, etc. and congenital. This is a classic example of a radiograph of the hand showing osteoporosis. First of all, there is diminished density with the marked lucency of the bones. And also note, 
white cortical lines to the cortex as if you have drawn with a white pencil a line and then trabecular resorption in the pongeosa bone. So, the major finding is the marked differentiation between the spongiosa and the cortex. The cortex is thinned but not absorbed. The cortex is thinned whereas the spongiosa bone sometimes you see the exaggeration of the trabecular early on. Eventually, there is no spongiosa, completely resolved, phantom bone they call it. Again, a cone view of the left hip and a 60 year old male came with a fracture and he was stepping down the stairs and just fell and there is a fracture. This is a pathological fracture, it is not just traumatic fracture. What is the pathology? It could be just osteoporosis or sometimes a plasmocytoma or myeloma. Unless you take the investigations of the rest of the body, you cannot really come to the diagnosis. But the point is here osteoporosis, not the trabecular pattern. Look at the nice cortex, thin white line, and then of course pathological fracture with the disruption of the trabecular. And in the spine, when there is complete collapse, complete wedging of the body, you can see vertebral planar, almost like a wafer type of vertebra. Because this patient particularly due to cortico. Now, I was referring to osteomalacia, the confusion between osteoporosis and osteomalacia in the young radiologist. Osteomalacia, you can get generalized lucency as you get an osteoporosis. Occasionally in osteomalacia what happens, there is increased density explained by the excessive osteoid as though to compensate for the protein, proteinaceous matrix ground glass appearance, the trabecula, the differentiation between the cortex and the spongiosa are gone. The cortex wedges with the density of the spongiosa. Osteoid seams, so called loser zones or stress fractures, where even a pulsatile artery can produce a loser zone. They, of course, naturally the bones are malachic and then soft, that is why deformities, particularly in the pelvis and the other bones can occur. And lack of differentiation of cortex and spongiosa, as I said already. Endosteal and periosteal newborn, occasionally you will see, it is probably due to stress, paraarticular calcifications, fractures, and eventually osteomalacia leads to secondary hyperparesis. Again, osteomalacia, lack of differentiation of the cortex and spongiosa. I am pumping this point in the youngsters because that is the most important. Endosteal and periosteal newborn, that does not mean there is a osteomyelitis or a real fracture. Fracture, real fractures can also occur with minor trauma, secondary hyperparathyroidism. Radiograph of the pelvis in a female, and you, what you find there is increased density of the bones. Not all, of course, increased density of the bones can be due to radiographic technique also. If you underexpose, bones density is increased. Overexpose, bone density. That you have to keep in mind. Apart from that, you look at the deformity of the pelvis, the pubic bones and old fractures are healed. And if you look into the femoral shafts, both on the right and left, there are loser zones. And they are attempting to heal up spontaneously. That is why there is increased density. And trabecular pattern is exaggerated. This is a typical picture of osteomalacia. And I was telling you about the loser zones. Look at the scapula, there is a transverse lucency. This is not unusual for a traumatic fracture to occur. So, how did it occur? This is what is called the loser zone because osteoid seams are there, not mineralized. Even a transscapular artery, those pulsations can prevent mineralization of that part of the bone. That is why you get the loser zone. Again, examples of multiple. Those are zones. And then there is what is called a renal osteodystrophy. Say chronic renal disease is not uncommon, it's common. And in that you get both osteomalacia and pseudo fractures. Again, look at the bones of the foot. There is increased density. See the syndrome, renal osteodystrophy is a syndrome. You can get osteoporosis, osteomalacia, hyperparathyroidism, soft tissue calcifications and osteosclerosis. All these 
five combined together, we call it elastic dystrophy. Any of them can predominate. For example, here you don't see much of subperiosteal absorption of bone, but what you see is increased density and osteomyelitic changes because of the looser zones. How do you estimate osteoporosis? In order to diagnose and for prognosis after therapy, we have to estimate osteoporosis. Again, to repeat the same method, methods that you can use. But dual energy X ray absorption, the DXA, popular. And quantification by ultrasound is also done. Differential reflections and attenuations by broadband ultrasound, sending BEA pulse through the bone and measuring the reduction of intensity at different frequencies. Cal calcanium takes more than a minute to perform. People think it now is all consumption of time, but just a minute. Preferably a calcanium. And you can do quantitative ultrasonography. Now, again, coming back to the other advanced imaging modality, which is so popular today, that is computer axial tomography, computerized axial tomography, in short, CT. Particularly in articular disorders, in rheumatology, cross-sectional views you can get. Ligaments, tendons, and muscular changes you can get with good resolution. Early erosions, as you said, early erosions can be done by ultrasonography, but in CT also, but earlier you can get an ultrasound than in CT. Early calcifications, which you cannot really tell by ultrasonography, all you can tell is it is a cogenic, but it's a fat, calcium, bone, you can't really differentiate. Whereas in, uh, by CT, although the plain films may not show any calcification, CT is so sensitive, it shows early calcification. And of course, identification of vessels and nerves. Cross-sectional images can't, with the high contrast resolution, CT 0.25 percent, whereas radiographs 5 percent. See the high sensitivity. They used to call earlier CAT scan, which in 1972, that was the first time the CT scan was invented by Hounsfield, got a Nobel Prize later. And look at the sacrum and it's looking like a smiling rabbit or something. And it's a cat. Sir Godfrey Hounsfield and Alan Cormack are the people who have got Nobel Prizes. Role of CT, what is the role? Look at the cross-section of the apple. We always say when you see an apple, it looks so nice. Unless you Take a cross section, you don't know how many germs are there, how many seeds are there, how many rotten things are there. So, the CT also gives us the cross section of the bones, cross section of the structures, cross section of the brain. From head to foot, we can do CT. For anatomical localization, cross sectional image, as we said already, detection of calcification, tissue differentiation. Is it fat? Is it muscle? Is it tendon? Is it bone? Is it cut? That tissue differentiation can be done by CT. Outline soft tissue component, reconstructional images. You can reconstruct the various planes, cross-sectional, coronal, sagittal, etc. These are the Hounsfield units. Earlier, you remember in ultrasound, we were telling about uh, echoes, echogenic, hyperechogenic, non-echogenic, coalesce, and hypoechogenic. Here, we use Hounsfield units, you know, in terms of for example, 3,000 is bone and minus 1,000 is fat and air, for example. Lung minus, because the mammary gland it contains fat, it's minus, whereas spleen, pancreas, water as zero is taken as the state. So you measure the densities in a CT by Hounsfield unit. If it is, say, 2,500, bone immediately. It's minus 200 or 400, then you can think of fat or 